So our subject tonight is the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, or the Hart Seller Act. It's a law that many Americans have never heard of. We all know its great champion, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts, but the two men whose names are on the bill, Senator Philip Hart of Michigan and Representative Emanuel Manny Seller of Brooklyn, are far less well known. Looking at America today and how it has changed in 50 years, all because of these two guys and their 12-page law, is like following the mighty Mississippi all the way back to a pond in Minnesota or tracing the roots of rock and roll to a village in Mali. Hart Seller has been praised and blamed, celebrated and vilified for making the country what it is today, a far more diverse, polyglot, mixed up, interesting, and confounding place than it was in the year The Sound of Music came out. <laughs> it's the reason ethnic food in America no longer means Italian or a very specific and rigidly prescribed form of Chinese, egg foo young and poo poo platters. It's the reason for the abundance of Filipino medical professionals and the presence of Mexicans, lots and lots of Mexicans, many living here outside the law. The law has caused many undocumented Irish Americans to be disgruntled. Anti-Semites and white supremacists hate it, calling it a Jewish plot to open the golden door to the third world. The Center for Immigration Studies, a think tank that favors reduced immigration, has called Hart Seller immigration reform's original sin. They specifically blame the New York Times for what they call credulous, simplistic coverage of the law and the immigration issue over the decades. So let's try to remedy that tonight. <laughs> We're lucky to have some very expert panelists to put the law in context and to explain its specific relevance to this great city, why this act is worthy of a 50th anniversary discussion. I've written some questions with some specific panel members in mind, but I'd like to invite all of you to weigh in as you wish to disagree and jostle in the spirit of robust unruliness that is so central to what New York is all about. So Nancy, why don't we start with a brief overview of the law? Take us back to 1965. What did the Hart Seller Act change about America's immigration laws? I and mean, what problems or injustices was the bill trying to repair? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Lawrence, um, yeah. and Annie for the introduction. So as Annie already indicated, I mean, the big thing about the 1965 law, and everyone is celebrating the anniversary, not everybody, but many people are <laughs> celebrating the anniversary of this law now, is that it repealed the national origins quotas, which had been set in place in the 1920s. And the 1920s restrictions had been put in place deliberately to cut off Eastern European and Southern, you know, Southern European immigration for New York, it's Jews and Italians, largely, okay? And it, that was the, 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 really what was behind it. And that, in addition to having, well, the national, so the national origins quotas law were repealed in 1965. That made a big difference to certain groups, particularly in the New York area. It made a big difference to Asians who, had also, by the way, and this is what gets complicated, right? Had been subject to restrictions for much longer, <laughs> starting in 1882 with the Chinese exclusion law. But the 1965 law put an end to the quotas that, the, the unfair national origins quotas, which had kept Asian immigration very, very low to the United States. The other group in the New York, in New York City that benefited from this law were people from the English-speaking Caribbean who were, that really opened up immigration for them. Now, one reason I can tell you, maybe to enter into a little, I mean, there's a debate a little bit in the academic literature about how much weight we put on 1965 in terms of opening things up. First of all, we have to remember that after 1924, in addition to the law, there was the Great Depression and World War II. So that also kept things, low, the immigration low. Um, and the other thing is that the 1965 law, by putting all countries on an equal footing, in terms of the numbers who could come, really disadvantaged Latin American immigrants, who previously had had no limitations on immigration, although there were ways in which their immigration was limited. And also, around 1965, or a little few years before, had been the end of the Bracero program, which was an enormous temporary worker program. So the effect, actually, of the 1965 law was to put restrictions, particularly on Mexican immigration, and made it harder, actually, in a way, for Mexicans to come. So 
Um, that was an, also an effect. However, I think we can still see that the 1965 law did open up immigration, and we see the numbers. I think Joe is going to give us some figures for New York, but we can also see, see it for the nation. That 1970, if we look at New York or we look at the United States, was a century low in terms of the percentage of immigrants in the United States and in New York. In New York, it was 18% population and foreign born in 1970, because that was after decades of low immigration, and it kept going up after that, and the same was true in the country. So I'm going to. Okay. So let me follow up with that. Um, I looked at the bill itself and the signing ceremony, and President Johnson spoke um, in a ceremony at the Statue of Liberty. And his, his announcement began, his speech began, with a very striking disclaimer about what the bill would not do. He said, this bill is not a revolutionary bill. It does not affect the lives of millions. It will not reshape the structure of our daily lives or add importantly to our wealth and power. At one point earlier, Senator Kennedy had said this, the bill will not flood our cities with immigrants. It will not upset the ethnic mix of our society. It will not relax the standards of, a, of admission. Um, the more I write about immigration, the more I think nobody knows anything <laughs> about anything. Um, it, that includes me. When we make predictions about the positive or negative effects of something, um, there's very little we can, we can say um, about this. But maybe, can you talk, uh, whoever would like to take this, talk about how the bill, um, how these, these disclaimers uh, were mistaken um, or proved wrong by history? Yeah, um, <clears throat> there is a debate over the original intent of the bill. Um, family reunification was the major aspect of this law. And many of the people who were in favor of it um, felt that by making the basis family reunification, that it would perpetuate the current composition of immigration. So that's, that's what we're hearing. But what happened was, as the demand for visas, Nancy, you can disagree with me, I don't know. If you... <laughs> um, no, I'm uh, I agree. <laughs> I don't even have heard the sentence. Oh, okay. Uh, the demand for visas dropped off dramatically. Um, the last big year for Italian immigration was 1973, 72. And what happened was there was a preference system set up so that the visas that were not taken in one preference fell to the next, fell to the next, fell to the next. And then at the bottom of the, of the uh, totem pole was a category that permitted people um, to take visas, essentially, without many of these complex family relationships. And as the demand from Europe dropped, many of these visas became available to people in this non-preference category. I think the only issue was labor certification. They had to be, uh, it's had to be certified that they would not be a danger to existing uh, labor in, in the US. Um, so with this pool, this non-preference pool blossomed, and as a result, other people started to take these visas. I believe that uh, essentially that uh, the original intent of the law was not to do what we, what we see today. So. Yeah, I think it's often, oh, can I? Go ahead. Do you want to? I mean, it's often, that bill is often a, a sort of like a classic case of unintended consequences. You know, that they didn't know. Of course, I always wonder, you know, uh, who knows what they really thought, right? <laughs> but that maybe some of them had a notion. But still, by making family reunification the major basis for getting a visa to, for entry, you would have thought that someone would think. Now, it's true. Remember, this is a, still the lingering post-war period. I mean, the North and Europe was, you know, still recovering from World War II. They, in fact, Europe at that time was encouraging immigration into Europe. So Northern and Western Europeans weren't going to want to come to the United States, right? OK, so those were large numbers of people who could bring their families over. Um, right, Italian was, Italy was being rebuilt, so they weren't going to be coming. Eastern Europe, remember, that's another interesting thing to think of. Remember, Eastern Europeans and Russians couldn't leave, right? They, they had exit problems. We should also think about that, by the way. It's not just entry, it's exit problems. So that I think that, um, you know, I think the, the, they felt it wasn't going to, you know, rise that much. They were wrong. They were wrong, okay? They were clearly big time wrong. But I guess that's what the surprise is for me. So I, I hadn't known or thought about the fact that 
that the traditional uh, northern western European demand was low. So it's not like they suddenly erected this bill that said, you stop, you guys come. It, it was more in the context of uh, languishing demand, I guess. Um, while we're on the topic of unintended consequences, so a question for Nisha. So here's what the New York Times wrote in 1984 about the 65 laws numerical quotas on Mexican immigration. So quote, the immediate effect was to cut in half the legal immigrants from Mexico who had been running at, at about at over 20,000 for a decade. But the illegal immigrants kept coming. Isn't this a great example of what happens when a law collides with reality? Reality wins. If you declare unrealistic quotas, it, you don't reduce the immigration flow, you just illegalize it. So what about that argument that Hart Seller is the root of many of our immigration problems today? And what can a city do about um, an undocumented population that exists as a result of that? Thanks, Lawrence, and thanks uh, for the Tenement Museum for having me here today. So I couldn't agree more with the fact that our immigration laws, um, in a sense, uh, make something illegal that in reality will continue to happen. I mean, we see that with our current immigration laws now. We have more than half a million undocumented people in New York, all of whom are coming here seeking better opportunities and won't stop coming here because we declare something legal or illegal. Uh, and I think that may, I don't know that I would attribute um, all of today's issue with unauthorized immigration to the 65 law. There's also um, economic uh, factors like NAFTA and other things that have happened in the intervening years that have also created a push um, from uh, particularly South America and Central America, but, but across the board. So I think there's a lot of reasons to explain um, why we have a huge undocumented population, but I think one of the things that's been great for me in my role um, and being able to work in New York City on this is that we have the ability to actually, even if we can't change the federal immigration laws, which I only wish I could, um, that we do have the ability to um, make inclusion possible here in New York City, um, even for the undocumented. And I think probably the most notable example, which um, we I was lucky to work with Carlos on this, is the ID program and um, creating an ID card that is truly for all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. I think it's a little bit silly that if you're an undocumented Documented immigrant, you can't get government ID in this country otherwise. Um, but the ID card is inspired by the need for undocumented immigrants to be able to have an ID to get into schools, to get into government buildings, to pick up their kids, um, to do basic functions that all of us take for granted. But it was also designed as a card that's really meant to, and Carlos is going to show his off, um, <laughs> that is um, meant to be for all New Yorkers, right? So we have um, the ability, you can open bank accounts at a dozen different institutions, it can be your library card, you can get museum memberships from this card, and the benefits will keep growing. And so when you talk about inclusion and integration, I think that's what it looks like, right? Creating a program that uh, intentionally includes those who've traditionally been in the shadows, but brings them into a program that everybody wants to be a part of, and like truly everybody <laughs> signing up for this card with, um, you know, we're probably going to reach a quarter million next month um, who have the card. Um, so that's, I think, the kind of thing that a city can do. And when people sign up for the card, they feel like, I belong to New York City. I belong here. I exist here. And I think that is the reality we're talking about, regardless of what the law actually says. OK. Um, can I yeah. Jump in? I'm jump sorry. in. Um, oh, you have to jump in, too. OK. Do you want to jump in first? Oh, well, why, I, why don't you jump in first? I'll, I'll just say a couple things, because this is reminding me of some conversations that I've been having with my family now that I'm a new legislator in New York City, and I grew up in El Paso, Texas, on a border town. And the uh, I think the experience there is one to tell. And I know that the Tenement Museum really encourages those kind of personal stories. So I'll share a couple. And one is, uh, from my dad's side, my, fam my, my father's family came through the Bracero program. Uh, and that's how they, they were able to come into Texas. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, uh, it was v very different. And I think that's where this experience of, of Mexican uh, immigration, both uh, uh, d documented and undocumented happened where where my grandma my grandmother was undocumented and came over and in El Paso Texas when we talk about those visas that no longer required that kind of family unification piece um, those papers I hear were just given like nothing and uh, and and so as long as you came back uh, and remember this is one river 
separating just like Brooklyn and Manhattan. That's how easy it was to walk over the bridge. Uh, and, and so my family is now kind of telling me their stories about how you just got this piece of paper. You didn't know what it was. Sometimes you didn't know what it said, but if you had it, you're fine. You just go right back. And there was this, there was this like natural fluidity that currently does not exist at all. And so it's those kind of things that I think led to a lot of that, that influx. And, and so I, I kind of see that very, very personal in my, in my kind of Mexican heritage, border town living. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. Well, maybe since we're talking about undocumented immigration, and I don't want to minimize 1965. However, <laughs> the big increase in undocumented immigration to the United States was really a post-1990 phenomenon. That's when the numbers really started to go up. And so it's not just the, 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 the small quota that Mexico is you know, has the same quota, say, as, you know, national quota. Remember, we're talking about different national origins quotas that were eliminated by 65. You know, we still have quotas. You know, everyone can come in, right? But the, Mexico, for example, has the same quota as Jamaica, you know, so that, you know, that, that, that is a limit. But the militariz militarization of the border has, again, another unintended consequence, right? <laughs> another fa um, is that the increasing militarization of the border and the, uh, has had the effect of actually increasing the number of undocumented immigrants in the United States by making it more expensive, difficult, and dangerous to cross. What it's done is it's prolonged the stay. It's made the stays of undocumented immigrants longer. They're not going back. So actually, what over half of the undocumented immigrants in the US have been here for 10 years or more. And so that's been one, not the only, but that's been one of the factors which has led to the, the increase uh, in undocumented immigration, which now we have over, what, 500, I'm looking at Joe, who's the one who's the one who's responsible for us knowing this figure, <laughs> right, that half a million undocumented, about half a million undocumented immigrants in New York, which is one out of six, but in the nation as a whole, there are over 11 million undocumented immigrants out of about 40 million, so it's one out of four. And of those undocumented, more than half are Mexicans. So this is a huge problem in the United States. And as we heard, it's not a problem that New York City, great as New York City is, wonderful as this municipal ID card is, can fix. And we can talk about, I don't know if we're going to be talking about some of the programs, you know, that in, the one at that the moment that's in the courts, right? Uh, but, you know, there's attempts by the Obama administration to do something about it, although there are still temporary fixes. They're not legalization programs. So, I mean, in a way, if we're talking about immigration, we're talking about the 1965 law, and we're talking about what, what needs to be done now, um, we have a way to go. <laughs> Um, because there's nothing more boring than total consensus, um, I figured what I might do uh, is direct a question uh, at Carlos, but for everybody as well, um, and sort of channel the skeptics and uh, the folks who criticize uh, New York Times editorials all the time. Um, basically saying, you know, right-wing commentators, they often like to bash the 65 law um, as the source of all the evils destroying America today, starting with pressing one for English and ending with our illegitimate Kenyan Muslim president. Um, it's, it, it, it's amazing to see if you Google 65 law or you read what some of these um, nativist groups have written about it, it, it's, it, it's the turning point that they define as the point when America um, got into the handbasket to go to hell. So, but let me ask you, Carlos, so it, it's easy to mock nativist outrage but isn't there some legitimacy to the anxiety and worry that's caused by a seemingly uncontrolled flow of new immigrants? And aren't assimilation, cultural cohesion, and national identity or municipal identity legitimate things to think and worry and argue about? Um, and as a political uh, representative, how do you address questions, questions like that? Like there, there's got to be unease among the native born about yeah, absolutely, Lawrence. And uh, I think you called it the original sin. And, and I think that those kind of sentiments are definitely alive and well in New York City. Uh, in New York City, where, uh, or I should say in Brooklyn, where I represent, I represent Red Hook and Sunset Park. Uh, some of these neighborhoods and corners, uh, raise the roof over here, uh, include some, some 
historic Irish, uh, Irish community, Irish and Italian communities. And so um, with the wonderful invention of Facebook and Twitter, uh, I definitely get a lot of that kind of sentiment uh, the, the, the hater aid, uh, the haters of, of the world that are, are very kind of particular to the, that kind of sentiment. And I represent them too. And, you know, they live in the community. And so I really try to, trying to figure out exactly what the core issue is. And those issues are, and I don't want to legitimize them and saying that they're right, but, but they're real. They're real issues on, on language. Why can't they speak English? Uh, uh, they, they're bringing disease. Uh, they are are flooding our elementary schools, and these are these are these are when at the core of some of these questions. It's they're, they're real impact. We do have overcrowded schools in Sunset Park. Uh, we do have this language barrier that we're trying to fix, and so they're not wrong in some ways that we need to fix these things, but they present an opportunity. And this is where we're trying to do everything we can. And this is where uh, the mayor's office of immigrant affairs with our commissioner, Nisha Agarwal, and I, and the city council and the mayor, are trying to figure out how we, how we bridge those gaps of experiences to remove people from the shadows of experience and bring them into civic society so that they can participate and be just like them. Just like them being people who own homes, we want home ownership for them too, and they want it as well. They want to be able to go to a good school. They want everything that everybody wants. And so one of the things that we just wrapped up, and I don't know if you got, you got wrapped up in this, in this uh, f f fury, uh, participatory budgeting. I don't know, I, I, has anybody heard about that? Great, there's a couple hands. Awesome, thank you, I hope you voted. Uh, and this, was, this is a way for civic participation in, in residents, no matter what your immigration status is, which means that undocumented immigrants can vote for projects that were created by them many times in their community uh, for capital improvements, like uh, new school gymnasium improvements, uh, technology and labs for schools, uh, park improvements, um, uh, security cameras, NYPD on the commercial strips. In Sunset Park, two thirds of last year's uh, votes were cast by people who only spoke Chinese and Spanish. These, these were Chinese and Spanish ballots. Two thirds of the votes that were cast, that was 3,000 votes. That means that our immigrants are voting in a big way and, and engaging in the process when we allow them to. And, and so these are things that are changing and scaring people at the same time. And, and I think, I think all, we're, we're in this flux right now where we're trying to get it right when the federal government can't fix, fix what we're trying to do or what, where I think we're trying to go. Uh, the municipal government is offering an opportunity to open the doors for government. Okay. So now I have one uh, more. Sure. No, please. I have to. I have to. As, as a sociologist here, when you talk about assimilation, I must come in. I mean, this has been a, a subject on which sociologists have written a lot because this is an issue, you know, look, doing studies of. And I can just tell you, I mean, a lot of these worries, obviously people have worries. And I think one reason they do have worries um, is because of this continued replenishment of immigration, which by the way is different from earlier periods. And we have continued people coming in all the time, as well as a second and third generation growing up. And I think by the way, that's one of the things that fuels the fears about language, because people hear all these, you know, they hear people and they say, oh, they, they, how come they're not learning English? You know, when they realize that that person is only years. Um, but the, what the data show very clearly, study after study show on language, is that the same process of linguistic assimilation that occurred in the past is occurring now. Immigrants who come here when they're, by the way, many immigrants come here when they're adults. You know, they speak their home country language and they gradually learn more English the longer they stay. The children of immigrants who were born here, many of them are bilingual, although many of them are multilingual, but they all speak English well, in addition sometimes to their parents' language. By the third generation, the majority are monolingual English, and that is happening again. So English is not dying. It is, it is still alive, right? Um, and in other languages, people speak other languages. Actually, in today's world, that's good, right? That could be an advantage. We know also from studies that immigrants have much lower crime rates than native-born. Okay, so actually they do not raise crime. They actually, one could say, may lower it. Um, we know from a growing number of studies of the children of immigrants who were born in the U.S. that they are doing better occupationally and educationally than their parents, which again 
is what happened in the past. People expect that, you know, someone coming here with almost no education or low levels, that their child will be a physician or a lawyer. Well, hello. That did not happen in the past. And it's not happening now. Well, it happens now sometimes, yes. But I mean, and generally, my mobility <laughs> occurs in smaller steps, and it usually takes more generations. It happened in the past that way, and it's happening again. If anything, in fact, and I take these figures, I'm always looking at Joe, because he's the source of all our figures on New York City on immigration, that more than a quarter of immigrants are college educated or more. So we're having, actually, many immigrants are coming in very highly educated and their children are doing incredibly well. They, of course, have an edge with highly educated parents. Not just, I mean, I don't want to just say that just the highly educated parents have children who are doing well, but you see what I mean, right? And so we have today, actually, children of immigrants soaring ahead at even faster rates than they did in the past. And finally, I should say that the data on national identity, which is, you know, this issues of identities, is that the children of immigrants feel American. They do feel American. They often feel as they are hyphenated Americans, but then so do Italian Americans and Irish Americans. I mean, that's the American way. And so I think that we are not seeing, you know, I, I just wanted to emphasize all those things in terms of that we shouldn't, people who are worried, and I understand people's fears and worries, but that just to say that the data show <laughs> that they shouldn't be so worried. How are we doing on time? We're good? Because I thought I would have one more question, um, a, a demographic, broad demographic question for Joe that everyone can weigh in on, and then maybe we can go to Q&A. There's things that I hadn't thought about that you guys are, are wondering to know. So um, it's just this idea that New York is the place that proves the nativists wrong. Um, it's a, it, it proves that teeming diversity works. And maybe we can talk a little bit about how the law made this a better and a stronger and a richer city. Okay, um, let me just pick up on what Nancy just said. Um, the, about a quarter of the city's population um, has a difficulty with English. And it really doesn't change all that much because of something that Nancy mentioned that's very important. There's a tremendous fluidity to New York City's population. If I tell you our, our data show that every year several hundred thousand people come and go in the city of New York, every year. It's a tremendous fluidity. It's what makes the city exciting. It's what makes us very different from a lot of other places. So when I present data to you like on this slide, I want you to keep in mind that people come and go on a regular basis. We're constantly absorbing new people and exporting people. So. New York City is, you've probably heard this, is, it's a type of process. People come here to experience that. Um, this gives you a snapshot, this slide, a snapshot of how the 65 law has changed New York. 1970, as Nancy mentioned, 18% of our population was foreign born. The biggest group was Italian, about 200,000 foreign born in 1970. And you see, that close to two-thirds of the population essentially was from Europe. You see that on the left here. This is the immigrant, this is farm-born, the immigrant population. About two-thirds was European. And then you see the transition that took place over time as people started to take those non-preference visas, also as people started to apply for work visas. In other words, there were several categories of preferences in the law that allowed you to come in based on skills or based on needed labor. And several Asian countries, for example, started to take those visas in the late 60s. And that started a transition. And then family reunification kicks in, where the immediate relatives, um, in the case of New York, the immediate relatives of legal permanent residents, it's called the second preference. In the 70s and the 80s, it was huge here in New York. And it was huge with the population from the Caribbean started to take those visas, and you see this transition that occurred. As the city's population of foreign-born increased, you see by 2010, 3 million foreign-born, which is bigger than the entire city of Chicago, okay? 3 million foreign-born, and you see the mix. Latin America, the Caribbean, 
non-Hispanic popular. No, I didn't mean to pick on Chicago. I really didn't no, pick on Chicago. <laughs> you, know, huh. um, the, you see that the increases are occurring across the board, um, that we've got the Caribbean non-Hispanic population that figures there uh, big is Dominican. Um, the Latin, uh, I'm sorry, the Caribbean non-Hispanic, I meant uh, Jamaica. Um, the Dominican Republic, of course, uh, in Latin America. Um, Europeans still coming in, but the shift to Eastern Europe, for example, Poland. And then as you move up the line here, Asia, of course, number one historically and still today is the Chinese population. If you would ask me where this bar is going, Asian population likely going to increase. The Chinese population is going to become a bigger factor. The Dominican population and the non-Hispanic Caribbean is beginning to show signs of waning. Why? Because they go other places. They go to the rest of the region. They go to the rest of the country. It's part of a progression that occurs. But I want you to keep in mind what we said. Essentially, that there's a great fluidity to the city's population. It's what makes the population strong. And um, I like to say, in reaction to the other question, that nothing in life is free. If you want to harness the energy of immigration and the vitality of immigrants, there's also the challenges of that immigration that you need to deal with. But New York has historically shown that if you manage to do that, you produce a really incredible city like, you know, like we have uh, today. So. I should explain what I'm passing around. It was well-timed to this answer. But when I was uh, looking in our archives in preparation for this talk, I found an article from September of 72, which I, I think I accidentally cut the date off the piece. But it's the New York Times discovering how the law, how the, how the demographics of the city were changing. Um, and seven years later, they, they said, oh my gosh, Chinese next to Little Italy and different varieties of bocce players. And it's hard to read because I had to fit it on one sheet of paper, but it's kind of an interesting bit of slice of life city reporting from the early 70s. So if anyone else wants to weigh in or we can go to I Q actually wanted to throw one more um, thing into the mix before we open it up to Q&A, which um, when you read some of the nativist writing on the 65 law, there's another original sin that they complain about, which is the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And I think one of the things that is um, important and moving, and again, sort of raises this question of why people thought it wouldn't be transformative, is the fact that the 65 immigration law came on the heels of uh, a lot of successes and, and soon to come successes of the civil rights movement. And so it was really, when you read the bill text, so much of it mirrors the language in the 64 Civil Rights Act, right? And so the influence of that time period, and particularly the kind of movement building and organizing and anti-racist um, themes that came out through that organizing, I think, are reflected in this law. And then the impacts, of course, were to increase the um, tremendous diversity, not just of the city, of the country. So I think that's um, one reason why I actually find this immigration law to be uh, pretty inspiring, is that I, I do think it was sort of um, a product of the civil rights movement, which had lots of ramifications beyond um, just civil rights laws. And then the um, trajectory of the data that um, Joe just described is very resonant and speaking of personal stories with my own family story, right? There were the special kind of skills-based visas that came into effect. And I think the thinking was, oh, maybe we'll get some German engineers and we'll get, you know, some other folks from Western Europe. But in fact, it was Indian engineers like my dad who came and then petitioned for my mom to come. And then um, that sort of story of um, all of the family members that we went to dinner parties with were kind of following this pattern of history that was very much um, set in place by the law. And I think um, significant to note as well on a personal level. Lovely. Yes, Nancy. Just to say, I'm, I'm looking because we had these questions in advance, I should tell you, in terms of the way in which immigration made New York a richer, more diverse, uh, what is this, greater city. I think we should also think that in the absence of this massive immigration, where would we be, right? I mean, first of all, New York would be a smaller place, and not just it would have fewer people, but there would be fewer demand for certain services, and by the way, jobs. I mean, there would be, you know, we're worried about overcrowded schools. Without immigration, we'd be closed them. You know, we'd be closing even more hospitals than we already are, right? And we also wouldn't have nurses to, 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 to serve in them. We wouldn't have people to do, uh, you know, immigrants have opened a lot of businesses in New York which have created jobs for themselves as well as for others. Um, 
I think also an issue, and I should mention, I mean, one of the things in terms of just the sheer numbers of people, too, has kept up um, a demand for jobs in, in, in New York City, public uh, jobs in New York City, which to cr talk about another group, I mean, one of the post-civil rights America and New York City, um, uh, a phenomenon is that this allowed and provided an opportunity for African Americans finally to get into, you know, to move up and to get into jobs, particularly into jobs, into government jobs, which were more open. Without this massive immigration, there would have been far fewer government jobs. And so actually, I mean, this is one, you know, the other, it's often talked about, you know, are immigrants hurting African Americans, but in many ways, they've helped African Americans in New York by providing <laughs> people, right, for jobs that, you know, for, for the, and of course, immigrants by coming here have created a demand for goods and services. So I think they've been a big, I mean, we can go through many other ways in which, you know, uh, I, uh, in which they've benefited the city. Also, one more thing, and then I'll stop, is that they have revived many neighborhoods that were on the decline. I mean, that we would see, and, and, as I think Lawrence mentioned, they've given us good food, right? <laughs> I, I think actually it was a reporter in the New York Times who wrote a number of years ago that New York City has lost its reputation as a city with lousy Mexican food. Now, Carlos, you may disagree with that, <laughs> but at least, <laughs> but at least we're, we're getting there, yeah, right? Well, you just we're moving to, in the right direction. Yeah. You just have to look in our archives and see how often Ruth Reichel, as a food critic, restaurant critic wrote about immigration law as a, as a great boon um, in the 60s and in the 90s. So thank you so much. That was really instructive and I learned a lot. And it was a real pleasure. So shall I just call on folks as we have questions? Yep. Or should we? We're going to ask people to come to the front. Okay. So that everyone can hear them, please. So, we do not queue, right. So, I wanted to share something, some civic language leading up to the writing of the 1924 law briefly, and then I, I have a question about 65. Uh, someone writing in a very respectable newspaper, it was either the Herald or the Tribune, said, you know, about the Hebrew race and the Italian race ruining the American stock and then went on to say what next are they going to force us all to eat garlic and I thought you should be so lucky so I wondered if you could drill down a little more on 65 because I, I, I'm still a little hazy on it if I understand correctly with 65 you are now able, or you have a better shot of getting in if you have family petitioning for you to come in. So that's one set of visas. And then if they're not used up, then it goes into a more general pool. But how do those uh, distribution tiers actually work? Are, are they, they don't connect at all to population size or what? Okay, um, there was a series, the original law had a series of six preferences, approximately. Uh, the first was adult uh, sons and daughters of American citizens. The second was uh, um, spouses and children of permanent resident aliens. And the third was an employment preference. The fourth, I think, was um, brothers and sisters. It, it gets increasingly... Um, uh, well, f from the standpoint of the law, um, it's all really close family association. The, the farthest the field you get are brothers and sisters of, uh, of American citizens. And the sixth preference was, was a needed labor. So um, what would happen was there was a number associated with each of these preferences. And a, per, right, and a percentage of the total was associated with each of these preferences. There would be um, uh, something like 226,000 visas, and then a percentage goes to each category. As they get used or don't get used, they fall to the next and they fall through. And you end up with this residual category or non-preference category, which, as I said earlier, has to do with um, uh, labor certification, as they called it at the time, you had to have um, 
uh, had to be some evidence that you were not a threat to American workers. Uh, that's roughly how it worked. It's, and again, because of the emphasis on immediate family reunification, talking about spouses, immediate family, um, it, it obviously gave preference to people who had family here to sponsor. Okay, so the, naturally the creators of the law figured it would perpetuate um, current, the current composition. And that didn't happen over time. In fact, as people made their way in through the non-preference category, they then became the seed immigrants for future family reunification. And might I add that in later decades, people who wanted to come in from European countries, like the Irish, had a big problem because they didn't have immediate family members to sponsor them. So do you want to? Yeah, I mean, the other thing we should be, is that if you're a close family relative, what is it, a child, spouse of a U.S. citizen, you can come in outside of any of these preferences, which is the reason why the numbers are always larger than they say. Um, I should also say, I mean, it's interesting, I mean, the United States allows in, or no, allows in, we give out about a million visas, permanent resident visas a year. It's actually, I mean, we have an enormous problem with undocumented immigration, but when it comes to legal immigration, the U.S. actually has one of the most generous immigration systems in the world. We allow in a lot of immigrants. A, a, a million a year is, is actually large. It's larger than any other country, really. That, so it is very generous. Though interestingly, because we have a student now, what's interesting is that almost half of those are people who already have been living here. So when you see, you know, that many of them have been students, right, or they've come to work, and so they, tra that, I didn't, I hadn't realized that until recently, okay, that that's what's happening. But, yeah, but it is, I mean, Joe has outlined the preference guy. I, I, when I teach the, I have to just say, when I teach, you know, immigration, which I teach all the time, I always have students in my class say, well, can my parent come in? You know, I, it's, and, and the law is very complicated, so I always say, you have to go see a lawyer. <laughs> and actually, at Hunter College, we have somebody in the office. Because one of the things is, the law is always changing in complicated ways. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a compl it's not a simple system. But I think, to keep in mind that family reunification is the major basis for entry, right? Um, and that has been inclusionary and exclusionary. Uh, several decades ago, I um, was a, took a bicycle trip to Uganda, and we had a couple of guides, uh, Ugandan natives, and uh, near the end of the trip, one of the guides, a young fellow, said to me, I'd like to ask you a favor, and um, he said, uh, I said, what's that? He said, I'd like you to invite me o over to your country for a wedding or a ceremony of significance. He, he he didn't speak English that well, so I'm I'm, I'm summarizing how he expressed himself. I said, uh, why would I do that? And where, and Kui Bono, what's your interest in that? He said, well, if you invite me over, I'll be given a visa, and I will then have dinner with you, and that you'll never see me again. I'll move into the Baganda community in Cambridge. I'll get a job. They'll help me out, and I'll wait for the next amnesty. I said, is that what happens? Is that how the system works? He said, yeah, that's how the system works. Well, um, representing a, a, a man of uh, a senior uh, position on the timeline of life, I can say that uh, we never expected the consequences of that 65 law because it was lowballed by Manny Seller, Ted Kennedy, and others. Oh, they said it's going to have no consequences. We had no idea of how how much of a change, a disrupting change, this would happen to the country. And it gave rise to real nativist sentiments. For example, when we, uh, when we see uh, undocumented, when many of us would, would think in concepts of illegal, but yet we feel we'll, we'll be stoned for using that word in lieu of uh, the more politically correct word, we, uh, we say, my God, what's happening? Then, at the same time, we see uh, Silicon Valley marching down to Washington saying we need more visas for educated people because your schools can't educate the indigenous population of America uh, to such a quality and of such a sufficiency and competence that we can hire them. So we're facing in the eyes of someone like myself a flood of immigrants 
a depreciation of the base wage rate, a, a, a demand outside the pay envelope. That is to say, if someone does a low wage job inside the pay envelope, maybe 10, 12, $15 an hour, outside the pay envelope though, are a series of expenses, uh, language education, special services, demands for this, for that, all because we have a phalanx of low wage labor coming in. So, so the answer, I, the question I want is, how do you respond to this? This quote, this nativist uh, attitude really suffuses the, the emotions of many of us. And uh, we, we're cowed a bit because we, we don't want to be too politically incorrect. We have to pick our spots among ourselves and so forth. But do you recognize this anger and this frustration that abounds uh, in the American community? Yeah, I, and I think I, I kind of hinted at it before, but the sentiment is, is definitely alive and well, and we, we have to acknowledge that. What, what, what I think we also have to acknowledge is that the, the experience of this change, and we saw the graph there, uh, comes from your perspective. And so when we talk about the economy, when we talk about the new jobs that are created and the entrepreneurial spirit and the new culinary experiences and the new restaurants and, and the, new, uh, the new life that's breathed, that, 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 that's the breath of the immigrant community in our, in our, in our different parts of our city, that's, that's the other side to this as well. And so I think that, that that's, that's definitely a perspective, but there's multiple perspectives in this that, that, this, that, that Post 65 gave us. And for, for me as, as just a new legislator walking in with only municipal reins, working with a mayor that understands this in a big way, we're trying to make things better here in New York City the ways that we can. And I'll just say, um, I think the facts are pretty clear, right? Um, going back to the quote that um, Annie read that was you know, from, from the 65 Act, um, the contributions economically, just from a pure, crass economic perspective that immigrants make, it is um, better for us to have that immigration than to not. Um, and there are some um, cultural fears that I think come with that, but it is undeniable two-thirds of small business owners in New York City are immigrants. Uh, what if you took all of those businesses away? 80%, I think, uh, in Joe's research, huge workforce participation rates by immigrants, more prone to working than not. Um, and you look across the board at all of the different contributions, and if you took that away, right, if you took all of that away, New York City would be worse off than it is today just from a pure economic perspective, including all of the native-born New Yorkers. There are cities across the Midwest that are actually actively interested in recruiting immigrants to their cities because immigrants are reviving the economies of these cities. Dayton, Ohio is a great example with a very progressive outlook on immigration because of the impact it's had on that city. And there are many others. Um, I believe the, the governor of Michigan at one point had even said they wanted to have more of a Canadian style of immigration where states and provinces can actually determine who can come and go based at a state level for economic reasons. So I just think from the basics of the sort of sheer facts, uh, the reason you have Silicon Valley and you have big businesses going to DC asking for immigration reform is because they understand the dollars and cents of it, holding aside all of the other um, reasons why you would want to. And that, to me, would be one response um, to what you raised. Can I weigh in as well? Um, because this is uh, the, the kind of um, resistance that I hear all the time. I've actually stopped reading comments on our editorials because uh, commenters to the New York Times generally our readers often agree with us on most issues, especially as it relates to, say, the Bush administration or whatever. But on immigration, it's very different. The, 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 the general thrust of comments uh, is, is very similar to the issues you raised about the concerns that are caused by immigration that isn't and can't, apparently can't be controlled. So the response that I've come up with and I think makes a lot of sense or the most sense given that it's a bad situation, given that it's been decades since we've last revised and reformed our immigration laws in a way that sort of matches the, 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 the system with demand, um, is the, the, the question to ask back is what are you going to do about it? How are you going to 
take people who game the system, because there will be some, there will be many. There are immigrants who are unauthorized who should not be here, who are undesirable, who are gang members and drug dealers and all kinds of, uh, there's, there's a criminal threat as well. Um, what are you gonna do about it? And, the, and, and one way that's put very well by um, Luis Gutierrez, who's a representative from Illinois who I admire on this issue, is when you've got um, 11 million undocumented immigrants, this enormous haystack of people, shrink the haystack by allowing, you're looking for, for um, people to deport. You shouldn't just rely on this random system of catching people while you can and deporting everyone when in fact there are people who are members of society contributing with citizen children making the, the city and the economy and the country work better, um, let them come forward, put them on the books, make them work legal, legally, and, and pay f all their taxes and, and, and get them into the system instead of outside the system, then use those resources to go after people that you would like to go after. Otherwise, it's an uh, impossible job to do, to do the other. Just a thought. Anyone else? Um, I'm new to New York, so <laughs> uh, my question is uh, based on things I've read about New York, but um, a lot of editorials I've been reading about just the city in the past couple of years have been saying that there's an increasing uh, wealth gap um, and that it's becoming increasingly unlivable and then the price of the cost of living is, uh, is rising, uh, specifically Manhattan and, and parts of Brooklyn. Um, and I was just wondering how is that shaping uh, immigration, like are immigrants moving to different spaces, are they going into different job sectors, um, and what do you see is gonna happen in the, in the future as um, New York continues down this trajectory? I'll, I'll take that in just because I can, I can bring Sunset Park, for example, uh, and I don't know if you've kind of been following some of the news, but there's a lot of that happening there. Uh, we're in kind of a new wake of big questions like land use questions and uh, huge push for residential on our waterfronts. And all we have to do is think about Williamsburg and what happened there almost overnight. Um, those are the pressures that are really strong right now in Sunset Park. Um, we also have a big boom in manufacturing in Sunset Park, so they're big development uh, uh, focus in Industry City. If you have heard that name yet, you will soon. Uh, they have six million square feet of, of, of space that is all manufacturing, the, the deepest kind of manufacturing, M3. Um, and they are planning to, to activate that space for jobs. And so our big question, as, as, and my, my job as a representative, but also the big question from our Mexican and, and Chinese and, and Latino community that's been there for a while is, what about us? Are we going to get access to that? And I think the future of our community in Sunset Park is going to rest on that one question. How do, we, how do we bridge that gap? Now we're talking about language issues. So, so for the first generation folks, uh, like our parents that, that are, are here for, for the first few years, we need to bring in some language gap uh, programs so that they can learn the language and get into those jobs. For their children that are now 18, because they came here to almost 20 years ago, uh, we need to make sure that they have their education experiences so they can go into things like, um, which is expanding in a big way, uh, MakerBot, a uh, big 3D company, a 3D printer company that is now on three floors on one of these big, huge buildings. That's just an example of, of where there is, there's economics that's happening and we just need to make sure that we're thinking because the city doesn't always do this well. They don't think about the kind of community that they want to connect to jobs. They just want jobs for job's sake to put on a numbers list. But this administration and our city council is committed to making sure that we bridge that gap so that our, our, our immigrant community has access to that. And I don't think we have an, we have an example of how we've done that well before. Everything else has just been sheer luck or, or force of nature, but now we really need to bring good policy to make sure that that happens. And I think hopefully in the next 10 years, you'll see, um, you'll see a win. You'll see a win. 
And I'll just add to um, what Carlos said. I think one way to look at our current state of immigration laws that keeps so many people um, in the shadows is that it's a sort of state-sanctioned way of keeping people in a permanent underclass as well, right? If you are undocumented, you can't work above the table in jobs that will pay you better and make you less vulnerable to exploitation. You can't often get health benefits, so you're uninsured. You can't Unfortunately, higher education that can lift you to another economic class. So when we think about the fight for immigration reform, for me, that's inextricably tied to um, the fight for equality, income inequality, income equality in this country. And um, that, I think, is an important message that we want to try to get out in terms of um, immigration reform, is that our laws are keeping people from realizing their full potential. And um, you know, the president did make these announcements around the deferred action programs, which are temporary and don't create a path to citizenship. But when those were announced, uh, when DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, was announced in 2012, and you had hundreds of thousands of young people across the country taking advantage of them, some of those young people are now working in city jobs. They're working at foundations in New York City. They are doing, um, realizing their full potential, and that's that has got to be good for us, not just from a humanitarian perspective, but also from an economic perspective in terms of um, reducing the inequality. Um. I think that's a really great question that you asked because we have this enormous immigration coming into the most, you know, unequal, uh, the city in terms of economic inequality, the most, un, you know, this city with this enormous economic inequality, which, in which, you know, buying a home, renting an apartment, whatever part of the city you live in is r enormously expensive, right? The first question anyone asks, right, I, when I anyone moves to New York is I say, where are you going to live, right? I mean, and that's, an, you know, my, we have trouble recruiting people at Hunter College because they can't afford to live in New York. So in fact, I often ask my students when I'm teaching, how, why is anyone moving to New York? Where are they living? Where are they finding a place to live which they can afford? And in fact, immigrants, are paying huge portions of their income for rent and often sharing quarters. I mean, they're overcrowded. Um, you know, so this is an issue. And as neighborhoods like Sunset Park become more gentrified, then it becomes, you know, what happens is it becomes even more, you know, more and more parts of the city are becoming expensive. So, I mean, one possibility or one likelihood is that immigrants are just not going to be able, they're going to move further away. They're going to have to commute more. That's what often happens, right? Because they're not going to be able to, they're going to be pushed out of some of the closer neighborhoods. We already, some of them are living in the worst housing that still persists in some of the areas that are gentrifying. Um, so, I mean, I think that's, you know, clearly they're coming here because there are jobs. They're coming here because they have relatives who are not just sponsoring them, but also providing initially a place to live and helping them to get work. But as Joe said, there's also this churning. Some of them are leaving. And some of them are leaving, I am, no, I am sure, because they're leaving to go to areas where they can afford better housing for cheaper prices, where the schools are good, even if it means that they have to have long commutes to get into their work. So I think that that is a really, you know, I think in, particularly in New York, a, a really important issue, and it raises a lot of questions about, you know, we have three million immigrants, and by the way, some of the immigrants are well off, you know, <laughs> they have the money to live in, but m the most of them aren't, and they're providing actually services, that's the other irony we should say, that they're providing the services for the people who are, have a lot of money, but they're not able to live in those areas. And one of my students, to give a push for my a little plug, <laughs> from one of my graduate students who wrote her PhD, on immigrant workers in Tribeca, right? It's like at the most highest income of any zip code, I think, practically in the you know New York or the country. And you know the immigrant workers come in and they work. They don't live there, obviously, but you know. And uh, but that is an issue. You know that is a really interesting question in terms of immigration in New York. I was going to jump in. The question was asked by one of our new tenement educators. But to put it in tenement terms, um, you know, right now we, we take a tenement, we talk about immigration of the past and how people lived. If in 50 years we wanted to talk about how do immigrants live or what's a good place to think about immigrants living, um, 
as a museum, if we were to create a new tenement museum in 2065, it would not be the Lower East Side. It would be a basement apartment in Queens, right? Where that's like the only place you can get an apartment for $1,000 or less. And indeed, that's a big, huge issue that brings up a bunch of things with housing codes and, and everything. But so it's become much more complicated. But I think if we're looking at immigration on a daily level in terms of where people live, we're really moving with some exceptions that are important. But really, we're talking about Brooklyn and Queens and other areas. I think Manhattan's just the fourth largest, in terms of the immigrant demographic, it's the fourth largest Manhattan, right? It's Brooklyn, Queens, in terms of the percentage of immigrants, the proportion of immigrants in the boroughs. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Queens is almost half foreign born. Anybody know what number two is? Hudson County, New Jersey. In the region, yeah. And in the 40s and then followed by Brooklyn. I, can I, if I, I want to add, um, uh, what I heard earlier was something I, I, we hear echoed all the time. Our, our immigration policy, as Nisha points out, is it's incoherent in so many ways. Uh, we have people lining up legally in other countries waiting to come here and waiting years and years and years, and people who are here. Um, those people are here because the labor, uh, we, we use their labor. and. You know, the city obviously benefits, but the flip side of that is that some new Bangladeshi immigrants to Queens, 40-something um, percent of them are living in overcrowded conditions. Um, when we put some of our research together, we found Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian families who were four and five workers per family. Um, they would be at the city median household income by virtue of very high labor force participation for three or four people in the household. That's how they're, how they're making it. Uh, um, labor force participation, as Nancy said, is very high in the immigrant community because they come here, by and large, to work. We, in turn, want them to work. It supports the, uh, the economy of the city. But our immigration policy is incoherent when it comes to that. We don't admit. We don't admit it. And as a result, we have this kind of, like the word that's been used is we have this limbo that we've created. And uh, solutions. People need to come up with solutions. Um, there is a bill right in the Senate um, that had a potential solution. It, of course, it has died, right? And, uh, we we uh, talked about or previously, and um, one would hope that at some point uh, some coherence will be added to this because that's what you're relating to. That's what we're all concerned. Everyone in this room is concerned about this, about the lack of coherence in our immigration policy. So. I also think if we're talking about economic inequality and housing, then we're not talking about an immigration policy. We're talking about a policy for all New Yorkers and all Americans. And maybe, I mean, I really, we're talking about social policies to help people live. I mean, we're obviously we need policies about undocumented immigration and we need specific immigration policies. But we're talking about, you know, in the country, over 40 million immigrants. If we add on their children, we're talking about a quarter of the population of this country. We're talking about almost 60% of all New Yorkers. Um, and we're talking about policies really for everybody. And I think that maybe also, maybe that's a unifier, right? That it's not just immigration policy. We're talking about housing policy. And the things that, you know, the mayor and their office is trying to do, and you know, policies to make give people a better life, or not just for immigrants and their children. And increasingly, we're talking about immigrant children. And by now, given the time of the 65, we're talking about immigrants' grandchildren. And so we're talking about making a better life for everybody in New York, I guess. To me, it sounds kind of soppy, but I think that's true. <laughs> One important point that was made here that I um, have tried to make and failed, and I keep hoping and wishing that this might pierce the, the mentalities of folks on the other side of this debate, is that the fixation with the border um, just makes the problem worse by trapping people in. Um, and it, there's a circularity to immigration, to labor-based immigration, that is healthy and, and leads to um, a, a flow of immigrants that more closely matches the economic needs. Um, and when you when you ziplock the border, you create these weird um, distortions and problems that that won't be solved. And, and there's just this fixation with more boots, more drones, more sensors. We, if we can only seal it, we'll be OK. And in the, in the Romney campaign, I think I heard it mentioned once by Rand Paul uh, in one debate. 
one little line about this, this just idea that you trap people in as well as trap people out, but it's never taken hold, but someday perhaps. Anyone else? Well, wait, maybe one more question. One more question, then we're done. Sure. I'm uh, Wellington Chen from Chinatown Partnership. Um, I'd like to clarify the, the where credit should be due. I was always told that the 65 Liberation Act um, is not just Lyndon Johnson, but JFK. Uh, that, the, that was the initiator of this. So I hope that you can talk a little bit about that. And just a couple of comments about the border. The Chinese built the only visible structure uh, on, from the moon, that, that great wall. I, I hope U.S. learned that lesson, that great wall cannot keep people out. And that, that, that's, that's one point. It's a great tourist attraction. You can go to the moon and look at our wall, and that uh, could be a, someday uh, the basis for Virgin Atlantic to uh, go up there. Uh, uh, the other thing I want to say is that in nature, biodiversity is a must. And just think about this nation even before the 65. If you don't have Einstein today, Hitler almost beat us to the punch. He already had the heavy water. If it not for the Norwegian underground, he would be the nuts to the bomb, right? And there's a huge ocean to that. And that, that you know, in Mother Nature, why, did, why does bee exist? You know, and that, that cross-pollination is what is in research. Uh, the cross-pollination, the interdisciplinary, throw together philosopher, mathematician, biologist, voila, you come up with something totally you never expected. So I think that is what is not a, and, and I think the, uh, the benefit, I mean, you're looking at the product here. My mom came in in 1970 under the nurses category, the professional side, right? Assignment was to, to Newark, New Jersey not a place you would want to go to Newark in the 60s, 70s, all right? And you produce somebody like me now, right? And so, you know, I devoted how many decades to community service. And, and so this is not just about, this is just one single snippet of, of thing. And I, I think that the, the multiply that by the amount of, of torrent, of power, of, of this ability to work together, to, to, to have new creative, it cannot be understood. But I want to throw the back to the question to the uh, 65 and to, to, to see where we should uh, thank the people for. Thank you. Hybrid vigor. That's what, that's what makes this country great. Um, well, thanks very much. Um, I'm very grateful for your, for your time. So um, thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, everyone on the panel. That was wonderful. And, and thank all of you. I think one of the things that we like to have here at the Tediment Museum is a space for open discussion, and tonight definitely was. And thank you all for being part of it. Um, next week, we have a totally different event on historic ruins, um, architectural ruins. Um, and on May 13th, uh, I think a, a program that it, many of you would be interested in, uh, Safe Passage, which are lawyers who are working to help um, children who are kind of stuck in, in the process. And so we're really excited to host that on May 13th. And please take our brochure. If you buy a book here tonight, you can get, I think, oh, no. If you buy a book here, you can take your receipt to Russ and Daughters, which is just across the street. There's a new restaurant of Russ and Daughters. Um, talk about immigrant business. Um, held together over several generations, and you will then get, I think, 10% off your meal there. So I wanted to put that out there in case you want to continue this conversation at Russ and Daughters. And even if you don't continue the converse conversation at Russ and Daughters, I hope you continue the conversation wherever you go, and that you definitely come back and come to the Tenement Museum and let us know what you know. Thank you very much, and thank you for all of us. <laughs>